You are listening to audio from The Table. If you'd like to learn more about our community or donate to this ministry, please visit thetabletx.org. Well, good evening. Grace and peace. It is great to be with you. It's really good to be um, back. Some of you know I was, uh, I was not here last Sunday. And uh, I was doing some, uh, some ministry uh, in the mountains of Colorado, <laughs> skiing, <laughs> I don't know, some soul care, uh, which we'll, we'll get to. It's actually the title of the message tonight. Um, but it was, uh, it was, yeah, good rest, but I'm really glad to be back. And um, I know uh, the Reverend Denise Mason uh, preached for me, and she's great, right? For those who are here, she's wonderful. If that was your first time to hear Pastor Denise, then uh, you were, that was a, a treat. She really has um, just such a gift, gift for um, even beyond her writing and communication skills, which are, you know, fairly obvious, but just her soul, her spirit, it's just life-giving. So, uh, Denise, if you happen to be listening to this at some point, love you lots, so grateful for you. Thank you for investing in this, this community, so... Um, all right. Well, I, I want to give a warm welcome to all of you, um, but that, of course, includes those joining us online. Love you lots, and, uh, and anyone here who's new, kind of making their way into the community. Thank you for um, joining us tonight. So um, we are in, it's not, I don't know if it's really a series, that, I mean, the series is titled Lent at the Table, but really it's kind of a, a season um, in the Christian calendar um, where we are um, just kind of joining in with a broader church in, in a time of preparation as we, as Karen was talking about earlier, kind of approach um, you know, Palm Sunday and Good Friday and Easter. So it's um, really a time of uh, a lot of focus on discipleship. You know, who, who are we in relationship or in relation to Christ and what does it mean for us to live and move through the world um, differently uh, as uh, Christians? So uh, that's really kind of the focus of this, of this series. And so like I mentioned, the uh, title of my message is Soul Care, and uh, we're going to be in John chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 8 tonight. It's uh, just a short little story, um, which is really interesting. So um, we're going to go ahead, and uh, if you can read that with me, either in your Bibles or, uh, of course, as always, it is on the screen. So uh, the story goes like this. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Uh, if you're familiar with um, the Gospels, you know this is a place where Jesus went a lot. It seems to be, a, uh, these were his friends, um, this uh, brother and two sisters, Lazarus and then Martha and Mary. So you'll notice throughout the Gospel story, he's often kind of retreating to Bethany when he needs um, some rest. So uh, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Verse 2, here a dinner was given in Jesus's honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard and expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. And then John has this little aside. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. A key, as keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So he's got his little, little backstory. Verse 7. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you. You will not always have me. So this text, it's a, I'd say it's a, it's a rich one, you know, it's like there's a lot, um, a lot going on, plenty to delight and disturb us. There's the, uh, the fascinating background with, um, on Judas, uh, which I don't, as I don't recall, I don't think any of the other gospels like mention this kind of background about him, um, not only being the keeper of the money bag, but like, you know, uh, stealing from it. So, uh, we've got that kind of background on Judas. We've got Lazarus there who the text mentions, Jesus had just some time before, had raised from the dead. Uh, so he's an interesting character. <laughs> there he is. And then you got the two sisters, uh, Martha, of course, serving. Um, and then Mary reclining at Jesus' feet. It, it 
specifically names that she's letting down her hair, even in our culture, this would be a kind of a scandalous moment or, you know, kind of just like, oh, a little un socially uncomfortable, you know, like, what's going on right now? Now, you can imagine, that. I mean, 2,000 years ago, with all of its, you know, sort of cultural norms and much more strict, and I mean, in that culture, this is like, what is going on? So you've got Mary, you know, letting down her hair, perfuming Jesus' feet. Um, but it's interesting the way Jesus interprets it, right, is in light of his crucifixion, which is to come, which kind of casts a whole drama on the moment um, because it's really kind of a transition. It's like a buildup to what's coming, Good Friday, right, the, the crucifixion. Uh, and then kind of layered on top of that, you have not only all those relational um, dynamics um, between, like, Judas Jesus, between Martha Mary, um, but then you kind of layer on this, like, theological kind of argument discussion around, well, should this act have even been done? I mean, it says it's a year's wages. So you kind of translate that from then to now, and we're talking, like, ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 perfume. That, I mean, it does. it's just this lavish act of worship and adoration, and uh, it's, a, it's a lot of money, though. It could help a lot of people, and so we can kind of quibble, as John does, with Judas's motives, and yet I think, I don't know, if when you heard the story, maybe you were thinking, like, oh, wow, that is a lot, though. I mean, Judas has a point, and uh, I mean, I'm just imagining we had our State of the Table meeting, you know, a few weeks back kind of our church family business meeting. And uh, I'm just imagining if at the next one, I'm like, hey, great news. We've had a, gi it's a gigantic donation from an anonymous donor, $20,000 to the table. Oh my gosh. I'm like, and I've got an idea. We're going to hire a jeweler and create this giant golden cross. And just imagine every Sunday you get to come here and like, we'll have the, the giant golden cross, you know? I'm pretty sure y'all be like, ah. I don't know, man. I don't know if that's really the best thing. Like, maybe, I mean, that's, I guess that's nice, but maybe you split it up or something. I don't know. Just a better use of the money, right? So even, I think, in our, in our bones, even if we want to quibble with Judas, again, we're kind of like, yeah, but he does have a point. So you can kind of see this is like all, it's just all swirling around this story. Lots going on. It's quite emotionally charged, relationally charged, theologically charged. just a lot going on. And, um... So it got me to thinking, like, what's the essence of this thing? What's, you know, what's going on here? And, um, of course, there's many slants and takes on this, on this story. But um, what kind of came to me is that I think um, the reason it's resonated with so many generations um, is because it's naming a certain tension that we all um, kind of live in. It's, it's a tension between what we might call, uh, like, the practical on the one hand, you know, just are yearning for like, we got to just do stuff. We got to live in practical ways. And yet at the same time, we have this deep longing for beauty. You know, it's like for the lavish, for the extravagant, for the just, you know, you like splurge and just have the huge, just amazing meal or whatever. You know, it's like, this doesn't make any sense. We really shouldn't be going here, but it's the big day or it's whatever. And so we just sort of go for it, right? And it's like this tension that we kind of live in between like, well, it's not really practical. It's like the practical and the beautiful um, or what we might call the tension between um, action, a life of action and contemplation, um, a tension between um, service and a yearning for worship, right? And it's sort of this, it's like this story just goes right, right into um, the, the tension here. And um, if you're familiar at all with like other um, stories in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, then you know there's another story, um, this one in Luke chapter 10, where it's like very similar. Um, you've got, again, Martha serving, and again, Mary, this time not doing the whole perfume thing, but just it's, it, it, the story goes that she's just reclining there at the table with Jesus. He's speaking. She's just drinking in like his words. And Martha's in the kitchen, like, doing all the stuff. You know what I mean? Like, getting stuff done. Yeah. yeah. Like, and that's beautiful, right? And so, and she gets a little frustrated. So she goes to Jesus. And it's like, hey, can you please tell her to get up and help me? And if you're familiar with the story, you know Jesus, again, has this sort of strange response where he's like, No. <laughs> I'm like, what? He's like, actually, Martha, he says, Martha, Martha, you are 
busy and you're worried about so many things, but, but you've like forgotten the most important thing. Actually, Mary has chosen what is better. Again, can you, hear, can you feel the tension in that? Like, blah, I mean, why? Because like serving others, that's like a very Christian thing. Right? Like, that's a value in the kingdom of God. Sir, I mean, it's Jesus who said, like, I come among you as the, what? Servant of all. Like, this is, no, Jesus, what you're supposed to say is, you are correct, Martha, Mary, get off your booty and get in there and, and you know, like, but he doesn't. He's like, no, actually, she should. And then again, here we are, John chapter 12, similar story. And it's about this money and all. And, and again, we're, it's like we have this value for like, the poor, helping the poor. Again, this is like goes right to the heart of the Christian faith, right? Matthew 25, the, the least of these, you know, and there I was hiding. As you thought it was just the, the naked person or the destitute person or the sick person or the person in prison. But the whole time it was me. And so when, you know, what you did to the least of these, my brothers or sisters, you did unto me. Like this is Jesus' own words. And so again, we would read this story. And expect, she's like, you're right. This is too extravagant. And yet, he's, he again says, no, actually, just like in Luke chapter 10, here we are, John chapter 12, Mary discerned the better thing. She was in the moment, and she, like, knew what to do, and she was right. Even when everything in us says, I don't know. What is going on in this story? There's, uh, I want to come at this sideways. There's um, like this old, I don't know, probably in college they would call it a narrative trope. It's like a, a recurring theme in stories that, you know, the story's always different, but like, it's really the same story. You know, it's sort of just, pl- the characters are different, it's different setting, but it's like the same story. And there's this, uh, this old narrative trope. I was thinking like, which um, stories have I seen it in, just in film? Um, just in the Pixar world, this is like three different stories. It's um, the narrative arc of like Up. Um, it's the story of uh, Cars 3. It's the story of uh, Toy Story 3 with that terrible bear, Lotso. Um, now, again, all different stories, but like there's a thread through it that's like a very similar story. And so um, kind of zooming out, I'll give you like the this, this story. Okay. So there's, a, there's an old, we'll go with the man. There's an old man. And he is a, a curmudgeon. Just a curmudgeon, like just bitter. He doesn't want to help anyone with anything. Then, entering our story is our hero, our protagonist. And she is like the opposite she is young. She is vibrant. She, like, whereas the old man had this frown etched permanently onto his face, just never smiles. You know, she's like the opposite. This smile is just light of her face. She is young. She is idealistic. She is passionate. She, is, like, she, she, wants, she just wants to help people. She just wants to make a difference in the world. She wants to love. Like, just, she's just wonderful. And of course, in the story, what happens? They meet, right? They, they connect with one another, and she maybe, like, goes, it's always kind of a different way, but somehow they have to, like, connect, and then she has to, like, kind of start getting into his life a little bit, right? They kind of have to become friends, even though the whole time he's like, I don't want any friends, you know? But she's like starting to relate, you know? And so maybe like in one story, it might be that she goes in his house and there's pictures on the walls, you know? It's the story of his life. And she asks, well, oh, who is this? And he, of course, the first time shuts her down. I don't want to talk about that, you know? (laughs) But she, week after week goes by, month after month, she keeps asking questions and slowly what happens? Slowly, yeah, the story, it starts to tumble out. And, and what's the twist? The twist is always that, that old man, that this curmudgeon, bitter, unforgiving, I don't want to help anyone. Like, he used to be a much younger man. And only, now you might think, well, he was young, and then he was still like that, but that's the twist. No. Right? He, what, when he was younger, who was he? He was young and idealistic and passionate. 
He just wanted to make a difference in the world, right? And of course, again, the story is always slightly different, but it's like the same story. So sometimes it's that, um, his, but his sweetheart died, and then he got cold on the inside. Or, or sometimes it's that he had someone um, that he thought he could trust, and he couldn't trust them. They betrayed him. Uh, sometimes it's just that like, he wanted to make a difference in the world, and he got out there and was trying, and it just all like went to crap. It just nothing good happened. Quite the opposite. Like the very people he's trying to help like hurt him. And, and so of course they're the story all tumbles out and they're relating, relating. But what happens through the relating? That old man like starts to see a much younger version of himself in this young girl. And in the relating, this cold heart of stone what happens it starts to thaw and by the end of the novel or the movie or up or whatever the story is you know what what's happened the old man has found his smile again has been redeemed right and now this story it plays out over and over and over and we'll sit there and we know what's happening like we're watching it and we're like yeah i've seen this before it's like last time it was with cars and now it's like with balloons, you know, but it's like the same story. And yet we'll sit there and we'll eat it up and soak it up like, yes, this is so good. Why? I think, I think some of it's because we see, we probably, well, if you've lived enough life to get at least a little bit jaded or hurt or wounded, you know, you kind of see yourself in like both of those characters, but I think it's also that, even though it can be a little bit perhaps cliche, um, it's cliche because it's true. And I think the truth that that story is getting at is it's naming that contrary to what we might think, um, sometimes the, the most bitter among us is bitter precisely because they used to be the most open-hearted among us. And it was that open-heartedness that made them vulnerable. And they got hurt. Like, that's the wisdom of the story. Right? Because it's easy to kind of judge. Like, oh, that person is a curmudgeon. They're terrible. I bet they're always like that. Right? But that's the wisdom of the story. It's like, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. Sometimes the most bitter among us, they used to be the most open-hearted among us. And sometimes... Like the very person who says, I don't want to help anyone with anything, like used to 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, like were what in our society we call a helper. Like they were a therapist. They were a volunteer. They were, I mean, all the things, right? A teacher, a principal, an activist. Uh, maybe like they were a pillar in the church, you know? Like uh, they were a first responder, and what happened? They put themselves out there day after day after day after day. They poured, they gave of themselves. And then what happened? Then they got hurt in the process, right? This is, this is what just blows my mind. Like the, the fact that like, well, I'll just phrase it like this. Isn't it remarkable that we can be, um, how would I put it? Like basically doing a thing and forget why on earth we began doing that thing in the first place. Isn't it remarkable that we can like set out to serve people in whatever capacity and then come to resent the very people <laughs> we set out to serve? Like, isn't it remarkable that sometimes the worst among us used to be the best among us? but it's a cold, hard world out there. You see, um, I think Jesus and the Christian saints, down through the centuries, I think they see farther than we do. It's like we're on a path, and we just, we're shrouded in mist. We can't see where it's going. We just can't see. But like they see. And the way ancient Christians interpreted this text was they said, um, Martha and Judas, kind of even in his own way, perhaps, um, they are like a, they're a symbol 
of a certain type of person. They're kind of the old man, the person who they, they, they wanted to help, they wanted to serve, they wanted to put themselves out there, and they did, and they gave, and they gave, and they gave, but somewhere along the way, they got hurt, disappointed, jaded, confused. They forgot why the heck they even started doing this in the first place. Like, they just lost true north. They just lost it. And in that process, um, they slowly, well, the way the Bible put it is they lost, this is the book of Revelation, they lost their first love. That's what happened. They lost their first love. Here's kind of what I'm driving at. Um, if I, and I think we all do, if I travel the path of action and service without time, without space, for um, contemplation and worship, my destination will pretty much inevitably be burnout and bitterness. I think that's the wisdom of, of specific to this story. If I travel the path of action and service without this time and space for contemplation and worship, my destination will be burnout and bitterness. See, because some of our greatest minds in the Christian faith, they also said that Mary is a symbol, not of a lazy person. <laughs> Mary is a symbol of someone who did not leave her first love, who stayed centered on Christ, who, who remained in the moment and could discern when it was time to work and when it was time to rest, when it was time for service and giving, 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 and when it was time to say, no more, <laughs> right? When it was time to give and when it was time to receive. Now, just to be clear, this isn't about um, like choosing which one's better, you know? Um, instead, what I want to really advocate for tonight is us bringing them together, Martha and Mary. It's not either or, right? It's, there's a sense of both and. This is where, if you're familiar with the writings of Richard Rohr, um, who I really appreciate so much of what he's written, but his, his little organization, the, the Center for Contemplation and Action, well-named, right? He's, it's, it's bringing them together. Now, this word contemplation can be a little bit, uh, I don't know, a little foie foie. So you might be wondering, what do, you, what do you mean, contemplation? You just sit around contemplating things. Here's what I mean by contemplation. Slowing the heck down, nourishing your soul, nurturing your connection to God. That's what I mean. Slowing down, nourishing your soul, nurturing your connection to God. I think that looks a lot of different ways. It looks like um, coming here tonight, worship. Looks like worship, not only through music, but there's something I think really significant about gathering and like getting quiet. And perhaps for some of you, this is like the only time in your week that there's like a little bit of, you know, you know, kind of know what I'm talking about. It's like just like we need that. We need that. It's going to be about worship. Um, it can be contemplation. can look like um, scripture, you know, just taking time to like, not just read the Bible, like I've got my one-year Bible reading plan. I've got to get through this, you know, but like to soak in it. Take some time. Take some space. Like even 60 seconds can be like something. If you can slow down, not be quite so goal-oriented, which is strange how we kind of carry that same passion for productivity and efficiency <laughs> into our spirituality, which just doesn't quite work. God moves, and the soul kind of moves at its own pace, you know, <laughs> and we have to come into alignment with that. I think there's something beautiful about soaking in scripture. Just let it, see yourself in the story. Let God speak. Um, it can look like prayer. I mentioned these three because these are, I would say, like the basics. Of course, there's many ways people reconnect and nurse their souls and connect with God and I mean thousands. But I'd say these are like the basics that we never leave behind. You know, prayer um, just can be silence. It can be just speaking honestly to God. I love the idea of just holding up my burdens to God. People, situations, and just like, here you go. 
<laughs> I don't know how to deal. <laughs> just, oh God, just unburdening. It's, can you see how if, especially as Christians, right, because we have those values for helping, serving, giving, laying down our lives, trying real hard for God. You know, that's kind of how it can end up kind of weirdly getting twisted, like where it's not so much about worship anymore. It's just about trying hard for God. I hope he accepts me, you know, or something that's just strange theology, but that's where it kind of goes. And we've, we've got to stay centered. Like, okay, God, help even my service be an act of, of worship. I'm going to close with this story. There's a a woman. Her name was uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. And she was um, really one of the most significant voices, uh, although she's somewhat um, not not well known, but one of the most significant voices in the civil rights um, movement in the 1960s. Um, A wonderful, wonderful woman. She uh, grew up in Mississippi. Um, She was uh, the child of sharecroppers. And early in her life, that's what she did, or even into early adulthood. Um, was a sharecropper, so just working the land. Um, Through a series of circumstances, though, she um, had a local activist who basically encouraged her to um, get registered to vote, and she didn't even know that was a thing. And this kind of stirred a lifelong passion for her to help um, her own African-American community um, register to vote. So she shifted from a sharecropper to an activist. She traveled primarily in Mississippi, but really all over southern states. Um, helping people learn to, um, how, to, how to register and then how to go in and vote. And as you can imagine, you know, in the 1950s, like, 60s, uh, this is not a popular profession. She was um, brutally beaten, assaulted, um, falsely imprisoned. Uh, I mean, her, her life was really in constant danger. And um, there's been a, a, a biography written about her titled Walk With Me. And that title is taken from a a key moment in her life where she was in a Winona, Mississippi jail, June 1963. She'd been falsely imprisoned. Then the guards proceeded to beat her with an inch of her life. She was literally, she said she was laying on the, on the, in the cell floor. She couldn't get up. She tried to get up. She couldn't get up. And she had the thought in her mind like this, this might be it. I might, I might not make it. And she, um, just whispered to her cellmate, who was also a fellow activist, Uvester Simpson. She said, um, I need you to sing with me. Sing with me, because I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to make it, and I need to know that God is with me. See, Fanny Lou Hamer was a, a Christian um, pretty much her whole life in singing. In fact, if you go on Google Images and look up images, almost all of them are her singing. She would lead people in Um, worship and song. She saw it as so integral to her work. So she said, Yvester, I need you to sing. And so Yvester started to sing the song, Walk With Me, Lord. Walk With Me. And Fanny Lou said that as, as she sang that, it was like she got this sense that someone bigger than her was with her. And she woke up the next morning and walked out of that prison. I think that's a beautiful image of, because of someone who is both Martha and Mary. Right? Her life, she was committed to the work, giving her life on behalf of others. I mean, she's about as Martha as it comes. Like, busy? Yep, real busy. And yet, at the same time, had the spirit of Mary. The spirit of worship and prayer and song. Because, and, I mean, it's a, it's a remarkable thing to live like through what she lived through and not become, as we talked about earlier, the old man, right? The burnt out, bitter, just eaten up with rage. How did she do it? She didn't forget her first love. She, she had the spirit of Martha and Mary. She brought them together. And so as we um, come to the table of the Lord today, I want it. I want us to come in that same spirit of it's a moment of contemplation. It's a moment of reconnection, of recentering on the broken body of Christ symbolized in the bread, the blood of Christ symbolized in the wine. And it's this moment of, yes, God, help me recenter, reconnect with you. And then may this act of spiritual nourishment, may it send us out those doors into the world in that spirit of Martha, ready to serve, ready to give. So 
Let me uh, invite you to the table with these words. This is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. And it's made ready for those who love him and for those who want to love him more. So come. You who have much faith and you who have little. You who have been here often and you who have not been here long. You who have tried to follow and you who have failed. Come. Come because it's the Lord himself who invites you. And it is his will that those who want to meet him should meet him here. Come to the table.